Hello and welcome once again to our Redeemer Lutheran Church Bible study on the book of Psalms. I'm Pastor Eric Kleinschmidt from Redeemer Lutheran Church with you once again. If you're looking for the worship service from our congregation, I will put that link up above and you can click over to that when you desire. We are continuing our study of Psalm 119. We are on verse 105 to 128, hoping to get through three new letters. That be Nun, Samic, and Ayin. And you can, let's see, see them over here on the right-hand column. I think that's for you. So we have the Nun uh, as an N sound, and then the Samic as one of the S sounds. If you look down at the bottom of that column, you'll also see the two W uh, kind of looking letters that also make S sounds. One of the joys of Hebrew is that there's three different S letters. Um, and then there's also Tzade, which has a T S sound to it. So always kind of fun. So Samic and then Ayan is kind of back up there at the middle top. Looks like a Y to us. That's one of the other silent letters, meaning that it doesn't actually have a sound. It's just merely a placeholder for vowels almost. You put the vowels in between and above. So, um, yeah. <laughs> How do you start a, a psalm with a silent letter? Well, you know, uh, you figure it out. Anyway, so those are the three letters of the acrostic Psalm 119 that we uh, will be handling today. Having some uh, technical difficulties this morning, the computer is deciding to be slow and update. I think I'll spend some time maybe this afternoon after I make some house calls, trying to see if I can move it over to the other computer, which has a little bit more processing power. We'll find out, but hopefully this all works. So I'm kind of be quick today because I want to make sure that we get it in before we have a problem. All right, so let's get to the text. So right here, uh, Nun begins at verse 105, and we have those familiar words to us. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Uh, we sing them in hymns and liturgy. Um, and really, that's the only thing we take out of this, this section of the psalm. We just take those verses. They're nice. The rest of it, I don't know what we were going to sing about. Um, but it talks about an, a life that's oriented according to God's word. And this is something that needs to be more and more prevalent in our teaching, and not only as pastors to people, but also to families. Um, particularly to our young people, that um, Christianity is a worldview. It is not something that fits into your worldview. It has to be the whole thing. Um, if you're just making Jesus fit into your life, then you're not actually following Jesus. You're making him follow you. Okay, you're not actually serving Jesus, you're making him serve you. So if you're only doing Christian things when they are convenient to you, if you're only going to church when you don't have anything else to do, then you're not actually worshiping God. You're making God fit into your own worship. Hard truth, but that's where it is, right? So to orient your way to God's way, everything that you do, to be like, how would God want me to do this? Okay, so living out our vocation, um, you know, are we doing our jobs, our vocation, uh, our relationships to the best of our ability and being forgiving and merciful and faithful and all of that? Are we rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar? Rendering under God what is God? All of that, okay? How should I react? I have this decision to make about this thing. Well, what is the righteous way? What is the godly way to deal with this? Okay. So to use God's word as a way that shapes our life and guides our entire life, not just something we make fit into our lives is, is so important. And it used to be that um, it was a lot easier to have a Christian worldview because a lot of the world had that same Christian background, especially here in America. And talk about
about it at home, engage the, um, the questions that they have from a knowledgeable letter. They don't really know much about their faith, so they can't teach much about their faith because they were never challenged out there in the world because everybody shared their faith. Now it's entirely different. Christianity is once again countercultural as it was long ago. So it's actually proved to be good for the faithfulness of the church, but not for numbers. And we're so concerned about numbers. Um, so we look at the church as being more faithful, but also smaller. And COVID was a great winnowing fork for that. And we're still seeing that. Um, and that's, uh, that's tragic, but it's also true. And it's also what Jesus told us exactly would happen to the church as we move forward, that uh, people would fall away. Um, and um, so evangelism is still a priority, sharing the gospel, but we have to be intentional about it, and we have to change our worldview, um, and we have to give, especially our young people, the tools and um, the basis in order to gauge, engage their countercultural faith in a world that doesn't support them anymore. So that's our goal. How will we do it? I don't know, but I'm still working at it all the time. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It enlightens everything that I do, is what the psalmist is saying. They continue, I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. That's great. You can swear an oath all you want. Are you actually going to do it? No. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your rules. Uh, accept my free will offerings. Um, in addition to the regular offerings that were required of Jewish people, of Hebrew people, they also had opportunities to give free will offerings. And um, that was just something that uh, you wanted to, you could. And a lot of people made a great name for themselves by giving large sums, you know, obviously to be seen by others. Um, here the psalmist is saying, God, you know, please accept my offering. Well, doesn't God always accept offerings? Well, not always. If you go back and read uh, the account of Cain and Abel, you'll see that one of the reasons why Cain was so angry with his brother was actually because he was angry with God and uh, because God would not accept his offering. And uh, we believe that part of that is because Cain was giving God what was left over whereas Abel was giving of his first fruits. And um, so that's one of the ways that we understand giving, uh, that we give God first. Um, so again, we, we orient our life towards, towards God instead of the other way around. So um, God doesn't need your offerings. He doesn't really care about them. He's not bored up there waiting for you to praise him. Um, I, I, I would say they don't make him happy. You know, it's not like you cheer God up because you praised him today. No, um, our praise is a natural response to God's gifts. God gives, we receive, we give thanksgiving for that. So this is a little bit different. He's saying, accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your rules. So he's asking God to look favorably upon him, um, it's about relationship more than God needing his offerings of praise. It's saying, you know, let's, let's, I want to get back to a more rightly, re, right relationship with you, God, because I'm severely afflicted. Even though I'm keeping your righteous rules and even though I've sworn an oath and confirmed it, um, I'm still having problems. And so he's saying, God, I want to be close to you again. Um, so, so bring me back is kind of what he's saying here. Verse 109, I hold my life in my hand continually. That's an expression that I think means that uh, the, the person's life is in danger, or at least they feel that it is. That every day they're taking their own life in their hands is, is what he's saying, okay? And it's um, that's stressful continually. And the psalmist acknowledges that. And then he also says, but I do not forget your law. Uh, like, I know this is hard, God, and I'm really trying to do this, and it's not working out the way that I want it to. Um, and I'm not giving up, God. I'm just, I'm saying, please, give, throw me a bone here. Help me out. <laughs> I am severely afflicted. So I think we can all identify with those those feelings from time to time. 
The psalmist continues, the wicked have laid a snare for me. We've seen this in the other parts of the psalm, particularly last week's study. We had this over and over again. I do not stray from your precepts. Again, there is that. It's untrue. In the sense that this person is a sinner like everyone else. So there are times when they do indeed stray from his precepts, from his commandments, from what God wants him to do, the path of righteousness. And yet the psalmist is is saying, but my desire is to walk in your ways and to follow the path that your word has illumined for me. And so that reflects the condition of the heart. As a pastor, I'm less concerned with individual sins as I am with the condition of the sinful heart. Let me explain that. So yes, if somebody comes to me and says, Pastor, I did this. I uh, smacked my brother in the mouth for no good reason, and I'm sorry, and I told him I was sorry, and I want to say to God that I'm sorry for that. And I can say, okay, well, receive the forgiveness of Christ for that sin, okay? That's, a, that's an act, but I'm, I'm really more concerned about why. Why did you do this in the first place? Um, why did you feel like that was a good, good thing to do or a necessary thing or, or whatever? And that gets to the root of who we are, that we are by nature sinful and unclean. And that's what we need God to redeem more than just the things that we do. See, um, I said to my confirmation class last night that a lot of people have this idea of sin as like you have a backpack. And every time you do something wrong, you, you pick up a rock and you put it in that backpack. And so Monday, you put 15 rocks in there. And Tuesday, you put 50 rocks in there. And Wednesday, there's 30 more. And, and, you know, you go on. And then you come to Sunday service and you confess before God and you dump out your backpack in, in the church and you, you go out and then you start it all over again. That's how so many people, that's how I thought of sins and the way it worked. But when you are in the state of grace, that is when you are with Christ, that Christ abides in you and you in him and you desire to follow Jesus, regardless of how well you're doing that, when you trust in Christ, it's like that backpack has a giant hole in the bottom. So as soon as you put that, that, that rock in, it just plops out the bottom um, because God has redeemed you entirely. It's not this this weird bar tab you're working up with with the Lord okay um, he continually forgives it's a it's a well of forgiveness and righteousness a constant flowing it it's not a stagnant pond of God's grace uh, so it continually washes us clean does that mean we should go out and add as many rocks as we can of course not Paul says by no means but we don't we don't carry them with us and then we don't answer for them if we die on a Wednesday and have to go to purgatory for three days because there was three days of sins that we carried that we didn't get to confess or uh, it's God's grace is so all-encompassing okay so it's the condition of the heart is the heart with Christ or not there is a difference between someone who says um, I am addicted to this sin and I know it's wrong and I keep doing it, and sometimes I even want to do it. But I know it's wrong, and I wish I could change because I know it's not good for me, it's not pleasing to God, it's not whatever. It's wrong. So the person who desires to change but finds they are unable to, that's a contrite heart, and that God will not despise. That person is okay, and I'm not as concerned with that person's faith as I am with someone um, who is convinced themselves that because they keep doing it, it's okay. And that's not a big deal. Um, that's a different heart. Okay. The sin might be the same. What they have done is the same, but their heart is not contrite about it. Okay. So as a pastor, I'm more concerned about the condition of your heart than I am with uh, an individual sin that you you might feel guilty for. We, we can confess that, we can forgive that, and but you'll notice that the forgiveness that Christ brings is whole. It's not just for our sins of commission or omission, but it's also redeeming our very nature. All right, so Jesus doesn't leave anything 
up for grabs. He takes care of all of it when it comes to sin. Okay? So, um, there is the condition of the heart that says, I do not want to stray from your precepts. And uh, that's how the psalmist can say this. And it, it's really not 100% true in the doing, but the heart is, is there. And so that faith, that hope is, is accounted as righteousness. Your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. Again, look at the condition of the heart that this psalmist is talking about. That I want to do this. I strive for this. I desperately want to be all this, but God, I'm greatly afflicted and I'm not doing it very well. And so please redeem me. Please give me solace. Give me rest. And God in Christ joyfully says, okay, and I already have, and it's yours. So that's uh, none, and uh, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back for you. See it there at the bottom, Samek. Oh, exciting, Samek, right? Okay, we're going to take a break and see you on the other side. All right, our next section begins with that S sound, that Samek, one of the three S sounds or even four S sounds in the Hebrew language. And um, interestingly enough, if I remember Paleo-Hebrew, impressive, right? Uh, what came before this, is, you see the Samek there, it's third from the top on the right-hand column. You see over there, it looks like a, a flat and then it comes around. I think it was meant to represent the the head of an oxen. So there's the flat part is like the horns, and and then the bottom is the the jowl, you know, um, and why that is that shape. But that's kind of where I think the if I remember correctly, that's where it came out of the pictogram kind of kind of way. I could be totally wrong about that. It's been a long time since I've learned anything about Paleo Hebrew or okay. So uh, maybe that interests you. Maybe it doesn't. But uh, you say, why do the letters look like they do? Oh, I, I, I remember correctly. I think Samic was supposed to look like an oxen for some reason. Ah, anyway, uh, the text. <laughs> Samic begins verse 113, and we'll see a similar beginning. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. And you say, man, these sections sound like they're just repetition, right? Well, yeah, It's if it's written by the same person, they're dealing with the same issue. And so these are just different ways that they might express them. And that's one of the ways that this is broken up. Um, so that when you pray the Psalms, um, when, you, when you see in them something that resonates with you in your current situation, and you take those words and you make them your own as you pray them to God, you can return to the next section and, and continue on. So you can kind of pray along with the life of whoever wrote this, right? And understanding that they're inspired by God, the Holy Spirit caused them to write what they wrote, but through the lens of their own experience, you kind of see a heart for God, of God in this too. So, um, it's only natural that a, the same author would come back to the same themes. And they're not so much meant to be read one after another, after another, after another. I think more it's like, imagine that using each letter for your morning devotion. So yesterday you prayed and, and read none, and today you're coming back and, and you're reading Samic, and you're seeing that I, I'm still trying to love your law, oh God. So it's a, it's a lifetime in this psalm. And that's why it's so applicable and beautiful for us as we read these words and identify with them. So before we talked about having a Christian worldview and it was countercultural, here we see, I hate the double-minded. You cannot serve both God and money, it says. You cannot love God and mammon, Jesus says. So to try to say, again, try to fit Christ into your life, that's not going to work. Instead, it has to be the other way around. Um and Christ is pretty, okay, well, 
So Christ is demanding, you must be perfect, even though your heavenly Father is perfect. But then he redeems you from that and sets you free and says, uh, I've set you free, you're free indeed, I've taken care of everything, so now you are free to live out your Christian life. In what way? Well, in your vocation. And so that means by being faithful in whatever situation God has put you in. And so it's not like he says you have to go climb Mount Nebo and uh, fast for 40 days and that'll be pleasing to me. He says, uh, no. Honor your father and mother. Uh, if they ask you to take out the trash today, take out the trash today. You know, uh, or better yet, uh, you know it needs to go out, so just just do it, and then don't seek praise for it. And um, you know that, uh, so you just live your life in a faithful way, but you're still living it with your path illumined by God's word and what God set as righteous. That's really what we're asking for. So, I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You cannot serve both God and money. You, you really have to go with one or the other, okay? And money is encompassing for everything of this world. What a, and mammon is encompassing for everything that's not the true God. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Again, God does not lie, and he is bound to what he has said. And so we can look at his word and look at his promises and go, these will not put me to shame. These will not fail me. And that's where we get, we get hope, okay? Depart from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commandments of my God. Notice how the psalmist is blaming like the people around them. Like, man, I, I would be able to, to be a lot of better Christian if I didn't have these terrible evildoers around me that are preventing me from keeping the commandments of my God. Um, so we, we can't blame other people for our own sinful choices. That doesn't, doesn't fly. We're responsible in the end. However, you definitely can say that the people around you influence you, right? Uh, if we go to 1 Corinthians 15... 33 and 34, this is taken a little bit out of context in, in terms of our application here, but it applies, and it's, it's elsewhere, like in Proverbs, uh, most uh, expressly stated right here in 33, do not be deceived, bad company ruins good morals. Who you're around influences you. If you're spending time mostly surrounded by non-Christian people, you're going to be influenced by that. Um, at our pastor's meeting, we were talking about the gender dysphoria and transgenderism and the problems it creates for our, our people. And one of the things that we, we saw in our, our evaluation of, of how people get into this has a lot to do with they are surrounded by people on the internet. Um, and so they, they create what's called an echo chamber of, of support um, and they, they remove everything critical because they don't they don't want to hear that. They want the affirmation. And, and people do this with everything, okay? It just seems right now it's very pernicious with the, the transgender stuff. Um, but it's, it can also be with uh, your your political views. It can also be with uh, religion and, and morality. It can be with um, even things like sports teams and, and whether you like Coke or Pepsi better. I mean, we, we do that. We, we think that we're getting... Uh, an accurate picture, but what we're really doing is seeking out people that agree with us so we don't have to be confronted. And then we imagine that this is true because everybody says it. Well, of course everybody says it because you've eliminated anybody critical from, from your life. So good, good rule of thumb. If your friends are not challenging you to be Christian, to follow God and seek the path of righteousness and be good, for lack of a better term, but I would say be faithful, then they're influencing you the other way. Nobody is stagnant, okay? There is no middle ground, right? Um, that's a generalization. I understand that. But I'm telling you, in most cases, if you surround your people, surround yourself with people that do not believe in Jesus, they are going to influence you in that way. Um, I think you should have people in your life that don't agree with you. I think um, people that do not share your faith can be a blessing to us. If there is a, a healthy respect and love, love there too, that has to be there too. Um, but do not be deceived. 
Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Um, so yeah, be careful who you surround yourself with and what you consume. What you consume is important. I mean, I'm not just talking about food. I'm, talk I'm talking about up here and, and in here, okay? Um, so be careful about that sort of stuff. So you can't blame others for your poor decisions, but you can be influenced by people that make poor decisions. So be careful and choose good friends, okay? Um, uphold me according to your promise that I may live and let me not be put to shame in my hope. Again, it's a confession that God has promised this, and yet there's a little bit of doubt there because the person writing is going through something, and it's normal and natural it, for us to go like god are you really going to come through like you promised because this this is looking rough hold me up that i may be safe and have regard for your statutes continually you spurn all who go astray from your statutes for their cunning is in vain here's the futility of of a life that is lived not in the illumination of god's word okay all the wicked of the earth you discard like dross therefore i love your testimonies my flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. Up until verse 120, what we see is this uh, pattern that, that goes through a lot of the Psalms of here is the way of the wicked and here is the way of the righteous. Isn't the way of the righteous better? Yes. So it all is about that the wisdom in following God's statutes, even though the world doesn't value it. Okay. So we see that pattern all through the Old Testament, and then also particularly in the wisdom literature and, um, well, in, in places like the, the Psalms and, and any praise, is that's a continual theme, all right? Verse 120, I want to take a little bit more time with. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I'm afraid of your judgments. We must understand that God's wrath is real. God really does get angry over our sins. He does. And, um, there is danger in continuing to sin willfully. God can harden our heart, meaning that he removes his, his attempts to try to change us and let, gives us over to what we want. That, that is dangerous. We may think we want it, but really that's not a good idea. Um, it also has temporal consequences. If you want to continue to smack your brother across the face for no good reason that's going to damage your relationship and then 10 years from now when you have to get together with your brother for something it's going to be difficult well yeah because you you did there's a temporal consequence to what you chose to do okay even if your sins are forgiven before god okay so uh there's that god has wrath over sins and our sins do matter also because God is just and we know our sins, there is always going to be a fear that we are outside the grace of God because our sins are great. As natural, we feel that. And that's continually, again, why God directs us to a Sabbath rest in his church where we hear that our sins are forgiven again because we need to hear that. We need to hear it often sometimes even more than once a week. And that's one of the reasons why we have private confession absolution available upon request, on demand, okay? Um, that's, that's part of our nature. We feel like we're outside of it. But there's another aspect here. My flesh trembles for fear of you. And I, I want to go to Luke 19, 28 through 40. It's the triumphal entry and Jesus says something really quite amazing and strange. And when Jesus had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you where on entering you'll find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this. The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. 
And the people just said, sure, steal our steal our donkey. Sure. <laughs> it's, it's a miracle right there. It's, but it happened just as Jesus said. And they said the Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus, throwing their cloaks on the colt. They set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples, saying, Teacher, they, they can't say this. They can't anoint you king. You can't come in here after the style of King Saul and King David, and you are going to get in trouble with the Romans. And also, they can't use this Hosanna, this God save us now language, for you, that's blasphemy. You can't be king and you can't be the Messiah. So rebuke your disciples for saying it because we're going to get in trouble and what they're doing is wrong. And Jesus tells them in verse 40, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Jesus says that the dust of the earth would open its maw and sing hosannas, that the rock on the side of the road would split in half, and then it would sing a hosanna to Jesus if his disciples shut up. Um, I don't think Jesus is, is being hyperbolic here. Uh, I think this would actually happen, and it would have been awesome. Uh, because if you go through the Old Testament, you see that there's a lot of times when there is God's judgment that happens when the earth opens its mouth and swallows people, Okay. People, when they rebel against Moses, that's one of the things that happens. They grumble. So be careful about your grumbling because the earth beneath your feet might eat you alive. Uh, why? So remember where we come from. Come from Adam. Where did Adam come from? The dust of the earth. We are dust and to dust we shall return. Even the very dust of the ground is under God's judgment and jurisdiction and authority and dominion and power, and we are just dust, okay? And so um, when we're talking about God's judgment, when we're talking about his justice, our very dirt flesh <laughs> trembles. But it also sings praise because we have Jesus who has redeemed us, a man of the dirt, of flesh, just like us. And so he has redeemed people of the dirt, just like us. So we tremble both in fear. And that word fear doesn't just mean afraid. It does mean afraid. We see that in the next part of that couplet. But it also means healthy, reverent respect for authority. God has both. And on Judgment Day, um, it won't be, well, it'll be both, right? Because we have the, the separation of the sheep and the goats. Yeah. So there is justice and there's also mercy. There is wrath and there's also forgiveness. That is our life before God. All right. We're going to take another break and come back for Ayin. Okay. A silent letter in the Hebrew. Oops. Maybe this one. There we go. Okay, our last section for today begins at verse 121, and it only goes to verse 128, and it's ayin. Let's look at the text and see where we begin. So in the past, we, the past two sections, we started with this whole thing that I love your law, your word illuminates my life, um, I hate the double-minded, all that sort of stuff. Here we begin with, I have done, past tense, what is just and right. Do not leave me to my oppressors. In that little couplet, man, there. So I did what was right, God. I'm still suffering. <laughs> Why? This doesn't add up. No, I should do what's right and then I should not have to suffer, right? That's how we want God to operate. We want vending machine Jesus, okay? 
I want to put in my $5 worth of good works and I want to get out a Twix bar or what I don't know what vending machines charge you these days, but I imagine it's more than they did when I was in college and stuff. So, um, yeah, that's the, that's the God we want, right? I give him this and I get, so when I want more, I give him more than I get more, right? That's the way we want, or at least I want, I've done what you've asked me to do. Why am I still suffering? That's a question that we have. And that's the question that's right there in Psalm 119, verse 121. I have done what is just and right. So why am I suffering, God? Do not leave me to my oppressors. So there is an oppression that's happening, even though he has done what is just and right. Um, a simple explanation for this. Why, does, do, why doesn't God work like a vending machine, right? Um, because he's not really all that concerned about this life. He's concerned about the life that is yet to come. So um, he is allowing free will to reign here for a time until he comes again and, and destroys all this and creates new heavens and a new earth where he'll set everything right. And then our will will be bound with God in joy and perfection forevermore. That's what we hope for. Uh, it doesn't make sense to the world. And it sounds stupid. It sounds terrible. But you don't understand it. Your word is not illumined. Okay. So um, bad things happen to good people because the devil is the prince of this world because there's temporal consequences to the evil of mankind that we do to each other, and also particularly because the devil does not like those who believe in God and believe in Jesus, and so he will use the things of this world to bring upon pain and suffering for no other reason than to bring upon pain and suffering. And maybe through that, convince them that God doesn't care about you, God isn't real, because he would do something about this pain and suffering if he was. So why don't you just not believe in him, and then we can be forever together in misery, right? <laughs> Um, so yes, bad things happen to good people because we live in an evil world and the devil hates you. Okay. So it does not mean that God isn't paying attention or that God doesn't like you because God has said, yeah, I know you got to suffer along with this for a time, but I've taken care of everything after this. So suffering produces endurance, just hold out. Okay. And, uh, I got eternity laid out. Everything's done for you in Christ. So just forget this. It's, this world is like the waiting room. So just deal with the Muzak and the, you know, the terrible magazines and uh, the uncomfortable chairs just for a little bit. And once we get past this this stage, there's there's an eternity of joy that we have. So um, the psalmist says, I'm, I'm struggling with this. So he asks, give your servant a pledge of good. Let not the insolent oppress me. God, I need a promise. I need some, I need need some help. I need a a, a hint, uh, something here. Okay, my eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. Again, calling God to task for what He promised. That is uh, something that we see throughout the Psalms, and it can be something you can incorporate into your prayer life. It's not that God has forgotten His promise. It's more than likely that we have. Or that we're having trouble believing that God's promise is true. I can say all that, and I think that's the number one answer. But there's also these weird passages in the scripture which talk about how God changed his mind upon the intercession of one of the prophets, okay? Or the action of the people. He, he relented from the disaster at Nineveh because of the way that the people repented. And they, it was so dramatic that um, Jonah was angry about it. He was like, I wanted to see them burn. And he, they repented. And he's uh, and like, Jonah was a terrible person. <laughs> you, read the, you read the account of Jonah, and it's like, this, this is the guy that God chose as a prophet? Like, ugh. Oh, no wonder he got swallowed by the big fish and vomited out on the shore. He deserved it. <laughs> but yeah, so anyway, um, we hold God to task for his promises, not because he forgot them, but more than likely we have. And yet there's also this thing where apparently it's possible for God to change his mind based upon the intercession of, of people in prayer. How often that happens, I don't know. Is it outside of God's will to do that? No. Does he already know he's going to change his mind because you're going to? Yeah. Then we get into mysteries that are above 
way above my head. So, um, but I have to tell you that's in the scripture that God changes his mind because people repented or people prayed. So deal with your servant according to your steadfast love and teach me your statutes. So look at that. Deal with me. Teach me. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. Spiritual growth, growing in your faith, is not something that you can control. Okay? It has to come as a gift from God. And God does that through suffering and persecution. That's in the New Testament, that we grow in faith through those, those tasks. Also, we grow in faith and we're taught by the Holy Spirit when we encounter the Holy Spirit. And the ways in which we encounter the Holy Spirit are the proclamation of the word. So Bible study, hearing sermons, talking about the word, reading God's word, particularly out loud and hearing it. Faith comes by hearing, right? And also a sacraments, which are the visible deliverance of God's word. So baptism delivers God's promise, an adoption of sons, forgiveness of sins, baptism saves, all of that. Holy communion, all right? We united with him for the forgiveness of our sins, the strengthening of our faith, and the strengthening of our fellowship. All of those, the Holy Spirit works through those means of grace to strengthen and grow our faith. All right? Those things happen in church. Got to be in church, man. I mean, yes, you can study the Bible at home and that sort of stuff too. But, I mean, they're designed to happen in a location uh, that's like just through that door back there, right, in, in God's sanctuary in church. And thankfully he scatters those all over the world. So it's, you're never very far from one, which is amazing that you have this opportunity to encounter God right down the street or maybe – 20 miles from you or 50 miles from you. So um, church, uh, church growth, spiritual growth happens by God's gracious action. He has to give it, okay? And you can't just assume that because I do A, I'm going to get B. Again, vending machine Jesus. If I put in the time and I read 30 minutes of the Bible every day, then uh, the, the Holy Spirit has to increase my faith 10% every, for every 30 minutes. God doesn't work that way. The, the Spirit blows when and where it pleases. So um, somebody can read the Bible and, and their faith grows this much. Another person can read the Bible and their faith grows that much. Why? Only God knows, okay? But it's not something you can control. What you do control is whether or not you are in contact with those places where God has promised to be present. You can't be grown by the Holy Spirit if you are avoiding the means by which the Holy Spirit would grow your faith. Hearing of the word, receiving of the sacraments. Church, if you're avoiding church, you can't expect your faith to grow. All right? The Holy Spirit doesn't drive around your block with a bus on Sunday morning and honk on the horn saying, get on the bus, we're going to church. And when you say, I want to sleep in, bust down your door and, and hauls your butt out to the, the bus and puts it on the bus and then brings it and plops it down in the pew and props your eyes open and opens your ears and makes you listen. No. If you wake up in the morning and say, I don't want to go to church, I'm going to sleep in today. You do control that. And absenting yourself from worship is dangerous. Bible says that. All right? Commands against it, actually. So, you can't grow your faith on your own, but you can starve it through your own action. Okay? So, be in the places where God grows faith. All this has to come from God. Deal, teach, give me understanding. 126. It's time for the Lord to act this is the most uh, brazen statement in the whole thing. For your law has been broken. God, people are disregarding everything you do. Like, when are you going to fix this? Okay, it's time, Lord. Hey, God, it's time. Let's go. Uh, that's a prayer of the church. Come, Lord Jesus, is actually a prayer that God would return in his glory, judge the living and the dead, and put an end to this nutso existence and bring us to the sensible existence of eternity. Okay? 
Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. (laughs) Therefore, I consider all your precepts to be right. I hate every false way. Here we see that return back to the beginning about how I have done what is just and right. Again, is that 100% true for whoever's writing this? Of course not, but it's talking about the condition of the heart. This is what I desire. This is what I'm praying for, God. This is what I'm striving for, and I know I don't do it right, but my heart is with you, and you have said a contrite heart you will not despise. So, recap of our, our study and what we've, we've hopefully learned through this is that the Christian worldview is going to be countercultural, and it is probably now more than ever we need to equip ourselves and also our families and our children in order to live that way. Also, uh, be careful who your friends are. Be careful what you consume. We talked about that. We learned about uh, the rocks opening and and singing Hosanna to God, which would have been awesome to see, probably terrifying in that way. But remember that we are dust and to dust we shall return. Um, Jesus had to be incarnate of the flesh of Mary in order to share our dirt. And then he could redeem our dirt. All right. And um, that's kind of interesting to think about. Uh, We could go into the Incarnation for a whole week and never examine all the beautiful mysteries that are there. But the one being that Jesus has to be of flesh in order to redeem us of flesh. Okay, And then also, we can't expect uh, God to be a vending machine where we put in whatever we want and we get out whatever we want. Instead, we orient ourselves to him, his will, his word, his path for us. You, You can't shoehorn God into where you want him to fit in your life and expect that relationship to turn out well. It's got to be the other way around, okay? And God puts you in places and makes it easy to, to live out your life following him because whatever he wants you to do, he will put in front of you that day. And your only task, your only prayer is to say, God, help me do this faithfully. And that's that's vocation, Okay. All right. God bless you. I will put last week's study up above if you missed that. And uh, hopefully this all happened without any technical difficulties. And I will see you next Wednesday. Yeah. Is it Thanksgiving that week? I think so. We'll find out. Anyway, I'm excited. Preparation. All right. God bless. Take care.